yeah. theme song. Welcome. Gather around my children, pull up a chair my friends. Let's all get together for the story that never ends. How do we get here? What's inside your head? What's bluer than blue? What's redder than a seat, put up your feet for the greatest story ever told. Fucking science story hour, cause science is knowledge and knowledge is power, because the world is so science story our theme song and you are watching the funky science story hour and uh, did you notice anything a little bit different from last time I changed around so that I'm using the opposite camera on my iPad because people were pointing out last time that my writing was reversed when I used the magic funky science story hour high-tech imaging video screen and this this show this story hour is peer-reviewed which means that it keeps getting better every time I hope and that's one cool thing about science is that nothing stays the same people tell us what mistakes we're making and then we do better the next time that's how science gets closer and closer to some kind of truth. You say, here's my idea, and you put it out there, and other people see your idea, and they say, well, that's okay, but maybe you're wrong about this, and here's a better way to think about it. And then, if you're a good scientist, you go, oh, you're right. I'll do it, I'll do it differently next time. And science gets better and better. So people pointed out to me that my writing was backwards last time on the magic um, funky story, our screen. And so, now, here we are, and I've switched to the opposite camera. So now watch this. Remember last time 
I talked about the word albedo and I wrote it out. Well, look now. And that was backwards. We'll watch now. A L B E D D O. Can you see? The one thing about this now is that my monitor has a big delay. Oh, wait a minute. It's still backwards. No, <laughs> I'm joking around. I was writing backwards. I think that now it's correct. Watch this. L, B, Do. Ha ha. So, we're doing better. Now, do you remember what albedo is? Albedo, it's kind of a funny word. Albedo, albedo. Um, maybe my next cat I'll name Albedo. That would be kind of cool. But I would probably call her Al for short, if it was okay with her. If she said, you can call me Al, I would, because Albedo is a little awkward. But it's a cool word. Albedo means how much light something reflects. So something really bright, like my eraser here, it's almost white. This has a high albedo. It reflects a lot of light. And something that's dark, like the magic funky story hour screen here, has a low albedo. And we talked about why that matters, because how much light things reflect changes all kinds of other things, like how hot it gets in the sun, and it even affects the planet, the climate of a planet. A planet with a low albedo is not reflecting as much light. It's... Uh, absorbing more light so it heats up. A planet with a high albedo is reflecting more light so it keeps cold. That's why an ice planet will stay cold. Well, anyways, I don't want to do too much review. I was mostly showing off the fact that you can see my writing in the right way because I've switched cameras. What we're going to do today on Funky Science Story Hour is uh, just get right to the questions that you guys have been sending in because you've been sending in some really great questions and some things that would be really fun to talk about. And um, I have a, another song up my sleeve, which I will pull out and sing for you a little later. Yeah, I don't know about you guys, but I've been starting to get a little bit stir crazy. Um, I haven't really been out in a few weeks. I like it here in my house. I'm very lucky that I have a nice house and all the food that I need to eat and uh, loving family. Uh, I feel very lucky uh, and I wish everyone to have these things that we all need. Um, but I'm also, I'm getting a little stir crazy. I mean, I've been going for walks in the neighborhood, but that's it. Um, I, I, I want to get out and go places. I bet you do too. But you know, one thing we can do is go places in our minds. We can travel in our imaginations. And that's one of the things that's great about science is that it lets us travel uh, to places that we couldn't possibly travel to uh, without the perspective, the insight, the knowledge we get from science. You can, um, in your mind, you can go on a fantastic voyage inside your own body. You can zoom into the little cells in your skin. Your skin is made up of these tiny little compartments called cells, so small you can't even see them. Your whole body, everything in you is made up of cells. But with science, we can image those and we know that inside of each cell there's little factories running, uh, or they're light factories because there uh, are um, there's chemical machinery, reactions between molecules making all the things that let you be you and let you keep living. And we can zoom in and see what that's, all, what that's like with science. Or we can zoom out and we can see the Earth from outer space with the pictures from our satellites. We can zoom even further out and go to the other planets. And then in our imagination, we can even go places where none of our machines have ever been. We can go beyond our solar system, out into the galaxy and other galaxies. Places so far we've never even sent a spacecraft there, and yet we image them with telescopes and we can imagine 
what it's like there and picture them. So especially now when we're off staying home, we can go on these trips of our imagination and in our minds we can go to all these cool, fun places. Okay, this is from Milos. Hello, Milos. Uh, Milos is 10 and uh, turning 11 next month. Oh man, so almost happy birthday, Milos. Uh, you're gonna be 11, that's really cool. And uh, Milos had a few questions. Um, and the first one, oh, this is cool. You mentioned infrared light. Is there such a thing as infra blue? Great question. The answer is yes, there is really, but we don't call it infra blue. We call it ultraviolet because infra means infra is a word that means below. So infrared is lower energy than red light or longer wavelengths. Remember how we talked about uh, a, there's light is made up, of course, of all the different colors. And we talked about what the difference is between the different colors of light and how, uh, say, the difference between uh, you have the spectrum where it goes red, orange, yellow, blue, green, indigo, violet. When you see the rainbow, you see all those colors, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And then the difference, of course, between all those colors, as we talked about, is the wavelength of the light waves. Light is made up of waves going through space, going through the air, going into your eye and allowing you to see things. But those waves have different lengths. So remember we talked about the blue light on the blue end of that spectrum is short, short wavelength. So the blue light are these little waves going through, through the air, through space. Whereas as you go through the different colors of the spectrum from the blue to the red end, you're going to longer and longer wavelengths. So by the time you get to red, the, the, the uh, wavelengths are much longer. So instead of the blue light, which is going through space, the red light is like that. Uh, now, of course, these wavelengths, I'm showing you like this so you can see them with my finger. The actual wavelengths are so tiny, I can't even, they're much smaller than my finger, so I wouldn't even be able to show you. So these are really tiny things that are, they're, they're, um, they're measured in um, what we call microns. And microns are one millionth of a meter. So if that's a meter and um, that's a centimeter, which is one hundredth of a meter, then imagine something that is one millionth of a meter. You can't even imagine. It's smaller than you can see. It's microscopic. Micron, microscopic. And uh, that's the size we're talking about. But the red wavelengths are much longer than the blue wavelengths. And then in the song, in the intro song, remember I said, um, What's bluer than blue? What's redder than red? And we learned the answer to that last time. What's redder than red is infrared. If you keep going out to longer wavelengths that you can't even see, you get to a kind of light, a kind of radiation that we call infrared. So if, you had, if your eyes were built a little bit differently, if we evolved different eyes, you might be able to see infrared, but you can't but we know it's there because we detect it with our scientific instruments. And you can, um, you can feel infrared because it's heat radiation. Infrared is heat radiation. And it's really important, we talked about this last time, in the climate of planets because it's visible light from the sun that comes into the planet, which is all the different wavelengths of visible light, the red, the yellow, the green, the blue, all mixed together, and it looks sort of yellow. But then when that visible light heats up the planet and the planet is radiating energy back into space, it radiates as infrared, which is that light that you can't see because it's redder than red. It's longer wavelengths. And infra means below, so it's below red on that spectrum. So that's just review. Now, uh, Milos's question, is there such a thing as infra blue? And the answer is yes, it's a good question. In other words, if this is uh, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, that's the spectrum you can see. If you go farther out on the red side to where you can't see, you get to what we call infrared, 
what happens, and I think this is what Milos is asking, if you go bluer than blue, what's farther out than we can see? Is there a kind of light? And the answer is yes, there is. And it's very important. We don't call it infra blue, uh, but we call it ultraviolet, which basically means bluer than blue, more violet than violet, right? And ultraviolet is really important. Ultraviolet radiation is coming down from the sun all the time. It's the stuff that gives you a suntan, and it can give you sunburn if you're, if you're in the sun too much. Uh, it can be bad for you if you get too much. In fact, too much ultraviolet radiation is deadly. It kills things. It breaks up the molecules of life. But you don't have to worry about that really here on Earth because on Earth, our atmosphere screens out the ultraviolet from the sun. You may have heard of uh, something in the air called the ozone layer. The, um, if you go up in the atmosphere to a level that we call the stratosphere, which is a little bit higher than, uh, than airplanes usually fly, you get to, there's a part of the atmosphere where there's a lot of a chemical called ozone. In fact, I'll draw it for you because you remember we talked about oxygen molecules, the stuff that we breathe. Let's see, let's get a good color of chalk here for ozone. Remember we talked about oxygen molecules, the stuff that we breathe, are made up of two oxygen atoms. Can you see that? Um, if I hold this at a better angle, I think, I think the uh, lighter colors of chalk are better. I guess you can see that. Um, let me use this yellow chalk. Um, so oxygen molecules, O2, remember O2, is made up of two oxygen molecule, uh, two oxygen atoms. Well, there's another kind of molecule that's made up of three oxygen atoms, like that. That's O3, and O3 is ozone, and ozone is very important because it's way up in the atmosphere, and it blocks ultraviolet light. There's ultraviolet coming down from the sun, and it reacts. It actually knocks off one of those oxygens and makes an O2, makes an oxygen, and then something else happens, and that oxygen rejoins the ozone. You don't have to worry about that, but the point is that there is ultraviolet, which was Milos's question. It's light that's bluer than blue, so the wavelengths are a little bit shorter than blue or violet light, and... There's a lot of it coming from the sun, and most of that gets screened out by the ozone in the upper atmosphere of Earth, which is why we're really glad that we live on Earth, and Earth has all these wonderful properties like oxygen in the atmosphere, O2, which we can breathe, but also ozone in the upper atmosphere, O3, which protects us from the ultraviolet coming from the sun. We mentioned ultraviolet last time also because... One of the questions was about what's it like on Mars and could there be life on Mars? And I talked about some of the challenges to life on Mars today. And remember I said one of the problems with living on Mars today, not just for people but for any organism, would be all the radiation at the surface of the planet. And that's because Mars does not have ozone in its atmosphere. And so all that ultraviolet light from the sun, which we're protected from here on Earth by our atmosphere, all that ultraviolet light from the sun just hits the surface of Mars and would sterilize it, would kill organisms living right there on the surface. So that would be hazardous. And um, any life on Mars is going to have to be protected from that somehow. So that's, um, that, was a good, that was a great question, Milos. Katarina says, my son voiced at... Volta? Voiced at, I'm sorry if I'm mangling the pronunciation, but asks, this is a cool one, how come glass is made out of sand but is transparent? That's such a great question, because it's true that glass is made out of sand. Uh, if you melt sand and then cool it again, you can get it to turn into glass. But glass, of course, is transparent meaning you can see through it. Um, for instance, this is a glass, 
and you can see right through it at me. I'm not monitoring live here, but hopefully that's working. I'm monitoring in a delayed way. Oh, it worked. Cool. <laughs> yeah. So, but so why can you see through glass if it's made out of sand? This is a great question. So, what is sand? Sand, uh, you probably know, and ooh, I just like the thought of sand. Let's picture ourselves for a second in um, on a beach instead of stuck in our homes here. In fact, I'm going to take my shoes off. Maybe you want to do the same thing. And um, just imagine that my feet are in warm sand. <sighs> and... Um, Let's picture ourselves on a beach, waves coming in, warm sand on our feet. Mmm, that feels good. And let's ask ourselves, what is that sand? Well, sand is basically ground up rocks. Have you ever picked up some sand and looked at it close up in your hand and you see all the different little crystals? It's, it's little pieces of rocks that have been ground up by, um, by erosion by uh, rain falling and running down rivers and scouring, grinding away rocks and run, going into the ocean and then the waves pounding on the, on, on, the, on the floor of the ocean and grinding it up more in storms. And it ends up in these little, little crystals of sand. And the word crystal is what's really important here for understanding why sand, why you can't see through sand, but you can see through glass. Because, again, you know, so much of this comes down to, we keep talking about light and the way light interacts with matter. Because so much of science and so much of these cool questions you're asking me has to do with the light and the way it behaves in matter. So, imagine again, you've got rays of light coming through and when it hits sand, sand is made up of all these little crystals of different kinds of minerals. So a lot of it is quartz. You've heard of quartz, which is um, silicon dioxide. Um, and there's other, there's other kinds of crystals. That are all, you know, if you look at the grains of sand, you see they're different colors. Some of them are white, some of them are black, some of them are a little bit red, and it's because they're made out of these different minerals. And there are these little crystals, and the crystals have surfaces. And the light will reflect off those surfaces, so it doesn't travel through. It's just getting reflected, and that's why you cannot see through the sand, because sand is made up of all these crystals. But then, if you melt that sand and reform it into glass, now this is glass, and it's the same stuff, it's the same atoms, but now it's not made out of crystals. The glass is all just one blob of these, uh, th these, these uh, little molecules, um, uh, mostly what we call silicon dioxide, which is a silicon atom and two oxygen atoms. Um, if you're interested on that level. But the main thing is that the glass, once you melt it, it breaks up all those crystals into one liquid blob. You stir it around, and then you let it solidify, or you blow it into beautiful shapes of uh, vases and other interesting... You've, have you ever seen glass blowing? It's cool. You can blow it when it's still a liquid, and then when it solidifies, you can like turn it into a bubble, basically, and when it solidifies, but it doesn't have crystals anymore. It's just all one continuous mush of those molecules. That's a technical term. A mush. A no, it's a non-crystalline solid, otherwise known as a mush of molecules. And it's because you don't have all those little crystals and the light then can travel right through it because it's not bouncing off the faces of the crystals like it would have been in the sand. Okay? So that's basically, Vojta, if I'm saying your name correctly, that's basically the answer to your wonderful question of why you can see through glass, but you can't see through sand, even though 
Glass is made out of sand. It's the, it, it, it's the crystals. Okay, let's see. Um, there were some other really good questions that were, um, that were sent in. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Lauren from Maine is seven years old. And Lauren wants to know, what is a virus? Yeah, good question. A virus is something that's maybe on a lot of our minds right now. Um, and uh, so what actually is a virus and how is it different from, from other kinds of life forms? Is it even a life form? It's kind of a fun question uh, whether or not a virus is even alive. Some scientists think they are and some scientists think they're not. Um, I'll tell you what a virus is and then you can decide if you think, oh, Carrie, that's good, amorphous solid. Yeah, yeah. Um, but no, that's not what a virus is. <laughs> that's what glass is. Um, uh, um, Strangely enough, viruses can be crystals, but, but I get ahead of myself. Okay, so in order to say what a virus is, let's talk a little bit about what life is. Now, that's kind of a weird question. What is life? Um, you know, it's, it's something that we could... There's so many different levels you could talk about. What is life? You know, it's a, it's a breakfast cereal. It's, boor, it's a board game. Uh, it's just, it's what we do while we're, while we're alive. <laughs> but I mean, scientifically, how do scientists think about life? In other words, um, if you compare something that is alive to something that's not alive, like a rock is not alive, but um, a hamster is alive. And so is a bacterium and an oak tree. And all of these life forms on Earth, there's certain things they all have in common. If you look deep inside them at a very small scale, I already mentioned that our skin is made up of cells, your skin. And in fact, your whole body and everything, all organisms are made up of cells. And your body is made up of many, many cells, millions and millions of cells. But the smallest organisms on earth that we call uh, bacteria they're made up they're single cells they are just one cell each and all cells all life have certain molecules in common we already talked about molecules in the air um, oxygen and nitrogen but there are also molecules inside you the molecules of life and we call them organic molecules. And I'm not going to go into too much detail now about what those molecules are and, and how they work. But I do want to tell you about the sort of two main kind of molecules that allow things to be alive. And there's one that we call proteins. P-R-O-T-E-I-N-S. Did I spell that right? Or did I spell it wrong? Somebody tell me. I might have mixed up the E and the I. I do that sometimes when I'm on camera. Um, but um, I think that's correct. Um, and the proteins are kind of like the building blocks of life. In all of your cells, there are proteins. And the proteins, they're kind of like the Legos. You know what? You know, Legos are building blocks. They're, they're, um, they're made up of small pieces and we call those small pieces amino acids. And I'll, it's some other lesson I'm going to show you exactly what amino acids are in terms of their nitrogen and carbon and hydrogen. And we know the details of that, but we're not going to worry about the details now. The main thing is we're going to talk... Oh, thank you, Bonnie. <laughs> I spelled it right. We're going to, we're going to uh, talk about the two main kinds of molecules of life. There are proteins and there are nucleic acids, sorry, nucleic acid, that's sort of a nerdy word, but it's cool, N-U-C-L-E-I-C, -E and you know the word acid, acids. So, you've heard of like DNA, the DNA in life, DNA is a nucleic acid, and there's another one called RNA that's almost the same, and those, the, the two main molecules of life are proteins and nucleic acids, and here's what's cool, 
I mentioned the proteins are the building blocks. They're like the Legos. And the nucleic acids are the instruction set for what to do with the building blocks. That's life. You have one kind of molecule that says, here's how to build the proteins that you need to live. And the proteins uh, build the structures, um, they build uh, the, 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 uh, they build the forms that allow you to, uh, to have the shape that you have, the shape that all organisms have. And they also, the proteins also, um, they run the factories in your cells. They say, you, chemical A, and you, chemical B, you get together and make chemical C so that you can live. The proteins are the ones that direct all the chemistry in your cells, okay? So we got the, uh, the Legos, and we got the instruction set for the Legos. So, um, proteins, nucleic acids. And what's really cool about life is that the Legos also make the instruction set, ultimately. You need, yeah, the, the, anyways, that, it's, it, it's, it gets into one of these things we talked about last week, a feedback, because you need proteins to make nucleic acids, and you may, need nucleic acids to make proteins. So there's all kinds of funny, funny business. But in, in a cell, you have these two things, and this is what allows life to keep going because the nucleic acids can copy themselves and make more of themselves. So when life reproduces, when people have a baby, or when plants have seeds and make more plants, or when bacteria split off and make more bacteria, it's always because these nucleic acids know how to make copies of themselves. And that's how life keeps going. So. The building blocks, the instructions. In every cell of your body, there are both of these. So, but what's a virus? A virus is something that takes this basic set of molecules and strips it down to the smallest package possible. So, a virus is simply a shell made out of protein And inside that shell of protein, there's a little strand of usually RNA, but a little strand of nucleic acid. And when a virus is by itself, it's just sitting there, protein around nucleic acid, and it's not doing anything. It can't reproduce, it can't build anything, it can't build any structures, it doesn't eat. It doesn't poop, it doesn't breathe, it doesn't, I don't think it thinks, it doesn't do anything that we normally think that life does. So maybe that virus is not even alive. But, here's what's crazy about viruses. If a virus can go up to a living cell, and a living cell is bigger than a virus, much bigger because it has more stuff going on, and a virus can go up to that living cell, attach itself, and then it injects that nucleic acid. Remember, the nucleic acid are the instruction set. It injects that nucleic acid into the cell. And once the virus injects its instruction set into the cell, then something really nuts happens. That instruction set is designed to say to this cell, ignore your previous instructions. Do not function like a normal cell. Instead, I am taking you over. And these instructions tell you, you, the cell that just got infected by this virus, that you are now a virus-making machine. So this virus will go up to the cell and inject its nucleic acid, inject its instruction set, and it says to this cell, you are now a virus-making machine. Ignore your previous instructions. And this, this RNA, this nucleic acid that's been in, instructed, it takes over the cell, and the cell starts saying, oh, I'm not a normal cell anymore, I'm a virus-making machine. And it starts making lots and lots of viruses. Instead of doing what the cell was normally doing, which was doing something inside your body, like 
digesting food or carrying blood around or uh, breathing or all the things, it says, oh, I am now a virus making machine. And it takes over the cell and it just makes many, many copies of the virus until at some point that cell will burst open and lots of viruses come out. And then all those viruses go around looking for other cells to infect. So that's how viruses work. By themselves, they're not even really alive. But they take over the machinery of a living cell and turn them into virus-making machines. It's kind of creepy, isn't it? I think it's really creepy. This is why you get sick when there's a virus in your body because, because it makes turns your cells into virus-making machines. The good news is that your body has defenses against this. You have something called an immune system. And your immune system gets activated. It's like the guards that wake up inside your body and, and there, there's a signal that goes, Danger! Warning! We've been invaded! All hands on deck! And the, and the immune cells, the, 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 you have these white blood cells and other parts of your immune system um, that, that send out and search down the viruses and go, we are going to encapsulate you and take you out of business. And then when that immune system works, these viruses get neutralized and you get healthy. Um, you know, it's weird to think of viruses like... When I describe it like this, you almost want to say, oh, those viruses are evil. They're trying to get us. They're trying to kill us. Uh, but on the other hand, they're just organisms, that, or not even organisms, they're just these, um, these forms, these almost alive things that have evolved. And they don't have any, um, they're not thinking, they're not trying to hurt you, right? They're just being viruses doing what they do. It's a little bit like if you think of human beings, if you think of us on the earth and what we're doing to some of the other species on the earth because we're changing the climate and we're driving our cars and we're changing the atmosphere and we're doing and, and we're cutting down forests and we're doing things that harm some of the other organisms. We weren't necessarily trying to harm them. We were just cutting down the forest because we wanted wood and we were just driving our cars because we wanted to go someplace. But then the difference between us and a virus is that we can realize what we're doing, right? We can look at the earth and go, oh, we're hurting these other creatures. Uh, that's not us. We don't want to be evil. We don't want to harm anybody. And we can hopefully stop that behavior and stop being like a virus on the earth, right? The viruses don't have that. They don't think. They don't have that awareness. So they're not going to go, oh, we're sorry, humans. So it's up to us to come up with the right uh, drugs to stop them and uh, uh, vaccines to make ourselves immune. And especially right now to stay home so that we don't go from person to person giving each other the virus, right? It's up to us. But we can look at our behavior on the planet and stop uh, and, and stop. Uh, being like a virus and stop uh, harming other species because we have the power of, of consciousness and being able to think and realize what we're doing. Anyways, that was a bit of a digression. But great question, um, Lauren, about uh, what is a virus. And this is from Sabin, age six. Hi, Sabin. Uh, and Sabin says, get this. If you put a cupcake in space, not in any kind of container, could you catch the cupcake and eat it, or would it not be good to eat anymore? Man, great question, Sabin. If you put a cupcake in space, not in any kind of container, could you catch the cupcake and eat it, or would it not be good to eat anymore? Wow. Let's picture this for a minute. A cupcake. Mmm. It's in space, and um, well, let's go to the board here. This is important. All right. Now, I gotta go back to my monitor. All right. Now, let's draw a cupcake. 
put some frosting on it. Oh man, this is making me so hungry. The frosting is kind of billowy. It's got some sprinkles. All right, we got a cupcake and it's in space. How do you know we're in space? Well look, there's stars. And way down here there's a planet. Maybe this cupcake is in orbit. All right. Now the question is, if you put this cupcake in space and it's not in any kind of container, could you just pick it up and eat it, or would space do something to it to make it not very good? Well, the first thing we should think about is, you know, well, let's just think about what's going to happen to that cupcake in space. So there's going to be sunlight wherever it is in space. Well, let's say it's in our solar system, sort of near our sun, maybe near the Earth. If it was way out in the galaxy, not near any star, it would be very different. Then you'd have a frozen cupcake, right? But in space, you might think that it's going to freeze, but there's going to be sunlight hitting it. So typically, the side of the cupcake that's towards the sun is going to actually get really hot because the sun is hitting it directly. And the other side of the cupcake the shadow that's going to get really cold. So on one side, you're going to have a frozen cupcake. On the other side, you're going to have a really hot cupcake. Now, a little bit this depends on, on how much sunlight that cupcake reflects, which means it depends on the cupcake's albedo, right? So if this is a chocolate cupcake, oh man, this conversation, I don't know about you, but it's making me really hungry. If this is a chocolate cupcake and it's it's uh, pretty much black or really dark on that side, then it's going to get hotter because it's going to absorb more sunlight and not absorb and not and not reflect as much sunlight. If this is, um, say, a vanilla cupcake with vanilla frosting, it's going to be brighter and it's going to reflect more sunlight. It's not going to get as hot. But the other thing to consider is that most most things in space are spinning. I've just been describing if the cupcake is just sitting there, the one side's going to be frozen, one side's going to be really hot, and the, and the frosting might even get like gooey and start to run and stuff. But most things in space are spinning, so if this cupcake is spinning around, then it's not going to be just hot on one side and cold on the other side because the sunlit and the dark side are going to keep exchanging, and the sun will be more even on that cupcake. And so it'll maybe be, uh, well, it depends what temperature it'll be. Depends on where in space it is, how close to that star, and depends on uh, what, what kind of cupcake it is and what its albedo is. But the other thing I think that's going to start happening to that cupcake, if you leave it in space for a while, is that it's going to lose some of the moisture. You know, you like a cupcake that, that's kind of nice and moist, and when you bite into it, mm, it's not like hard and crusty and dried out. But things in space, especially if it starts to heat up on, on the side towards the sun, or it heats up enough, it's going to start, uh, the, the, the moisture in that cupcake is going to escape. It's going to start um, evaporating into space. In fact, it could, the cupcake could even become like a little mini comet. Do you know what a comet is? A comet is just like a dirty snowball in space, but when the sun heats up one side of that dirty snowball, then the, the water starts to melt, or it doesn't even melt. We say it, uh, it sublimes, which is sort of ridiculous, um, from the sublime to the ridiculous. But, but, but the point is the water starts squishing out and making a jet of gas, and that's what makes the tail of the comet. So it might be that this cupcake would turn into a mini comet, and if, especially if it's not spinning and one side gets hot, and the moisture would start coming out of it. And if you left it there long enough, it might get kind of dried out. And that would be too bad because, um, yeah, I, yeah, what if it's a quickly rotating cupcake? Exactly, Rebecca, because if it's a quickly rotating cupcake, then I don't think uh, at least it would take longer to get dried out because it would not get as hot on one side. But once it dries out like that, then it's not going to be so good because I think you might still be able to eat it, but you'd bite into it and it'll be kind of like, Ugh. this is a weird cupcake, man. It's all like dried out and everything. But so I think um, 
the answer to your question, ultimately, and it was a really great question, is that it probably depends on how long you leave that cupcake out in space. You know, if, um, if you, uh, Sabin, age six, if you uh, just put the cupcake out in space for a little while, and then you grabbed it and brought it in through the airlock um, and let it come back to room temperature, I bet it would be okay. I would still eat it. Personally, I love cupcakes. Um, I would try it. If you left it out in space for, for a while, I would think the cupcake would um, get kind of dried out and kind of weird and it might not be so good. But on the other hand, if you were hungry enough, you might still want to give it a try. I don't think anything would happen to that cupcake that would make it bad for you to eat. Um, that I can think of, really. I mean, it may be that some of the ultraviolet radiation from the sun would do some weird things to the frosting. But I don't know, maybe it would be good. Maybe it would be sort of flambe, like um, uh, like creme brulee. Maybe it would be like cupcake brulee because of the uh, the the uh, what would happen to the frosting. Um, I don't know. I think I think it's something that we should ask NASA to try as an experiment. Um, and, uh, and, um, and, uh, you know, that, that would we be empirical about it. When I say empirical, I mean, we figure out what the truth is by trying an experiment and observing what happens. If we're going to be scientists about this, I can make a model of a cupcake in space and draw pictures like I just did, and we can imagine, but then we could also do an experiment and we can actually put a cupcake in space, make a prediction, and then actually test our theory and have the astronauts eat it and see if our prediction was right. And that's how science moves forward. Anyways, uh, you can see I've got the uh, magical Funky Science Story Hour Venus guitar here. Um, see, it's a Venus guitar. And uh, I picked it up because there's a song I want to do for you guys. It's a song I just learned to play today, so I hope I do a decent job of it. I've known this song forever. Not forever, because I haven't been around forever, but I've known this song since I was a little kid. I had this record of um, space and energy songs by Tom and Dottie Glazer, I think did it. Um, and then there's a band that redid this song a few years ago, a few years ago called They Might Be Giants. And uh, I actually know one of the, or I knew one of the guys in that band. I went to, uh, to college um, and uh, there was this band called the Mundanes that used to play, um, that I jammed with a few times. This guy named John Lindell was in the Mundanes and then he went on to form this band called They Might Be Giants and now they're, they're all famous and everything and they're, they're a great band. But they did this, they redid this song that I love, which is called um, Why Does the Sun Shine? And I think this would be a good time to play it. I'll try not to screw it up. A little bit out of tune, but... It's the E string that's out of tune. Or the B. Ah, it was the B string. Okay. The sun is a mass of incandescent gas, a gigantic nuclear furnace where hydrogen is built into helium at a temperature of millions of degrees. Yo ho, it's hot, the sun is not a place where we could live, but here on earth there'd be no light without the light. Gigantic nuclear furnace where hydrogen is built into helium at a temperature of millions of degrees. The sun is hot. It's so hot that everything on it is a gas. Iron, copper, aluminum, and many others. The sun is large. If the sun were hollow, a million Earths could fit inside. 
and yet the sun is only a middle-sized star. The sun is far away. About 93 million miles away, and that's why it looks so small. And even when it's out of sight, the sun shines night and day. The sun gives heat, the sun gives light, the sunlight that we see. The sunlight comes from our own sun's atomic energy. Scientists have found that the sun is a huge atom-smashing machine. The heat and light of the sun come from nuclear reactions of hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, helium. The sun is a mass of incandescent gas, a gigantic nuclear furnace, where hydrogen is built into helium at a temperature of millions of degrees. The sun is a mass of incandescent gas, a gigantic nuclear furnace, where hydrogen is built into helium at a temperature of millions of degrees. to deal with my, my tuning issues on this guitar. <laughs> the sun is larger than 95% of all, all stars, so it is in no ways average. Oh my God. You're right, Rebecca. Um, what can I say? That's why this is the Funky Science Story Hour, because we're funky, which means we're not perfect, but uh, we're, we're better than perfect because we're always learning and trying to learn. And that's what science is all about. And by the way, we're over an hour, but that's okay too because this is a funky science hour. And there's more than 60 minutes in a funky hour. Everybody knows that. Okay, let's see. Um, let's see. Right, let's, let's take another question here. Um, ooh. Let's say the Curiosity rover finds something on Mars. Something curious. I don't think this is uh, a, a question from a kid. I get some questions from adults pretending to be kids. They're like, yo, Dr. Funky Spoon, what's the uh, quantum efficiency of an endoplasmic reticulum? And I'm like, are you really four years old? Um, but okay. Let's say the Curiosity, that's a good question for all ages. The Cur Curiosity rover on Mars finds something Curious. How would we determine that we have found life on Mars? Yeah, that's a great question. It's not so easy. In fact, there was one time when we thought we found life on Mars. The first, space, the first spaceship we sent to Mars to try to find life was called Viking. It landed in 1976. And Viking... The idea with Viking was that we were going to land on Mars and then we were going to scoop up some Mars dirt and we were going to squirt some water into the Mars dirt and see if anything breathes and measure the gases coming off of that Mars dirt and see if, there's, if there was gas coming off of the Mars dirt, then it would mean something's alive in there. So Viking landed on Mars, which was amazing. It was so cool. It was the first spacecraft that landed on Mars and took pictures and that just like was mind-blowing. All of a sudden there we are on Mars and you can see there's a landscape with rocks and dunes and it looks like a sort of a dry area of Earth and it's like wow these are pictures from another planet. Is this real? Yes, it's real. So Viking was amazing but the what we call the biology experiment it scooped up some dirt and squirted the water in and then they measured and said is anything in there gonna gonna burp? Gonna gonna breathe? Gonna put out some gas? And then gas did start coming out of that dirt. Whoosh, started fizzing with with gas. And at first the scientists thought, "Wow, that's amazing! We discovered life on Mars." But then the more they discovered, the more they studied the results and looked at the way the gas came off of that dirt they started to realize it was not behaving like life because all the gas came out once in a fizz and then it just stopped. It wasn't like some life form that was in there breathing and gradually taking in the water and gradually breathing out. And they decided that it was a false alarm, that what they had really discovered 
was that there's some chemical in the dirt on Mars that when you squirt water in it, it goes and fizzes out some gas, which was kind of a cool discovery about the soil on Mars. But they decided that, and, and they did some other experiments too, I won't go into it now, but they decided that they had not really discovered life in that Mars dirt. What they really discovered was it's very hard to go look for life on another planet because we don't know exactly how to do it because we only have the example of life on this planet and we don't know if the life on another planet will be exactly like life on this planet. So it's not an easy question, how do you find life on another planet? But people in my field of astrobiology, we've thought about this a lot and we, uh, we have some ways that we think are good ways to find life that um, it, it's you have to make many observations if you make one observation you might be fooled but you look at what the molecules are made out of are they made out of something that can behave like remember I talked about nucleic acids and proteins the building blocks and instruction sets that are in, e in each of our cells and in every cell of everything living on earth has those same kinds of chemicals well maybe on Mars, the life is a little bit different and doesn't have those same chemicals. But it would still have to have some chemicals that play those same kinds of roles, that can behave in that way as building blocks or as instruction sets. So we know something about, you know what kinds of molecules to look for. Um, and then you also look at the effect that life has on its environment. Every organism on Earth, and we think every organism in the universe has to be affecting its environment in some way. Uh, we're taking in air, oxygen, we're breathing out carbon dioxide. Uh, there's other life on Earth that has different gases it takes in and puts out. But all life is going to be exchanging with its environment, affecting its surroundings. So you look at that way that that life is interacting with its surroundings, or the other cool thing you can do is look with a microscope. If you can get a sample and look with a microscope, you can find the cells. Remember, just as I spoke about cells, that all life on Earth has cells. Maybe the cells on those Martian alien life forms are not exactly like the cells on Earth life. Maybe they're not exactly like our cells or the cells of other Earth life. Earth life, but we think that the life on Mars or somewhere would have to have some kind of cells, something that it had little compartments because that's what life is, is little chemical reaction factories and you have to have a compartment for those chemical reactions to have a controlled environment so they can work right. So we think that life everywhere will have something that's like cells. So if you could look with a microscope, if you could study the chemicals that are inside that sample that we think might be life. And if you can understand the environment of that possible life form and look at how that organism is interacting with this environment, all of those things together might allow us to go to Mars with the right scientific instruments and examine something and say, ah, we found life. And if we don't find it on Mars, maybe we can find it in some of the other places we talked about, in, in Europa, the moon of Jupiter, underneath the ice in the ocean, or on Titan, or in Enceladus, the moons of Saturn. There are many places where we, we could look for life, and we just have to keep looking until we find it. Um, great question. Thank you for that. I'm going to um, wrap up now because, oh, oh hi, Jennifer. <laughs> My wife is, is, is waving at me even though she's upstairs in the house. <laughs> this is one way to communicate. Um, I'll be done soon. <laughs> um, and, uh, oh, thank you. People are saying some really nice things on here. Peace. Peace and love to you too, Colin. Uh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up now because I don't want to, even though this is a funky hour and not a normal hour, I don't want to take too many more than 60 minutes for this edition of Funky Science Story Hour. But thank you so much for, for hanging out with me for this funky hour. Gather around my children, pull up a chair, my friends. Let's all get together for the story that never ends. How do we get here? 
What's inside your head? What's bluer than blue? What's redder than red? Gather around my people, all children young and old. Pull up a seat, put up your feet for the greatest story ever told. Cause science is knowledge and knowledge is power Cause the world is so weird And weirdness is fun And there's so much to learn And we've all just begun Ooh, We can learn together We can understand the weather We can imagine ourselves in any place We can see the earth from outer space so much. Peace, love, science. Stay safe. Stay healthy. I'll see y'all next week. Bye-bye.